it comes to me this morning to, to offer up the opportunity to, to invite our best paper. And this is all the papers that are put forward to Encosa UK's ASEC all go through a very rigorous review process. It's a, a double blind review panel that, go, that don't know who the people are and, and make sure that we get what we consider to be the best selection of papers. They're all scored. Um, and it, it, it's a great honor to, to introduce to you this morning, Stuart Jobbins. Uh, Stuart's, for those of you who don't know him, has had many roles on academia, industry, uh, advisory boards, standards bodies. Uh, he's chartered with the, uh, a charter engineer with the IET. <clears throat> we'll, we'll maybe have a conversation later. Um, pref he's, one of, he's a professional registration advisor. He's a senior member of the IEEE. He's a member of INCOSI. He's the outreach director for INCOSI UK. He gets everywhere. Uh, and it's a great honor to bring Stuart to the stage for, this, for the best paper at ASEC 2022. Well, thank you, Andrew. Uh, let's hope I can live up to the hype. <laughs> um, this paper was born out of a series of personal questions. Uh, I visit an awful lot of uh, companies because I have a consultancy company of my own. And a large number of them are being pressured, shall I say, to do things faster. And agile is always a word that comes up as uh, a part of that. So on the back of that, I took it upon myself to go, well, actually, why is it so hurtful to apply agile in systems engineering? So I'm trying to kind of take you on that journey and try and use um, a popular book which people may have read, especially if they come from a software background by Bertrand Mayer, just called Agile! Exclamation um, mark, which took a four-year study of all the input processes to Agile and uh, distilled them into what's reality, what's hype, what's uh, rhetoric, shall I say. So I'll try and follow that. So what I hope you take away is how to interpret Agile in the context of systems engineering. And that's really important for me. Context is everything for Agile. Yeah. Um, Recognise why it's inconsistent with a software document and text. And if I'm being extremist here, some of the Agile extremists are really extreme. They're hard over it. If you don't do every practice in the Agile handbook, you are not doing Agile. That's their, uh, their view of life. I'm a bit more moderate, I think, amongst it. Um, so from that, I say, what elements of our Agile approach can we use in the process of engineering systems? And what should we actively avoid? So what are the contexts in which we should actually deliberately stay away from some of these things? Um, and the limitations of Agile for systems engineering of complex physical systems. Because I imagine if I was to ask this audience today, how many of you just to deal with systems which are virtual, business systems, etc., have no physicality, I probably wouldn't get very many hands. I imagine most of you are dealing with delivering systems which enable the world to work. They have some physicality. Yeah. So what I'm run through, I'm going to do a typical system engineering thing, talk about some definitions that I want to use, make sure I'm using the right definition. Um, I look at the original roots, the Agile Manifesto, which you know, the purists will say is the root of, uh, of their cause. Um, I'll also look at some of the Agile SE references. And the three I will use most of are Bruce Powell Douglas. Uh, for those of you who did anybody watch the series of Lunch and Learn that came up from Incozy last year? About this time last year, I think it was about eight or ten sessions. Anybody do it? Hand, show of hands, anybody? One or two only. Okay. Um, it was a bit of a publicity stunt for his book, I admit, um, but he's also, uh, he says some good things and he also makes some good cases which I'll, uh, I'll follow. Um, our own SE handbook and why it is challenged in its response on Agile. And some of you may be pushed into the scaled Agile framework. Well, I'll take a little, little pot shot at that one as well. I'm not of anything but, but provocative with this stuff. Um, and I'd really like to go into that context difference. 
why it works for software engineering and why it doesn't necessarily work in all walks of system engineering. Um, I'd like to sort of explore what I would view as a rewritten Agile manifesto for Agile SE. And we'll just do that. I'll take the former and try and rewrite it. And then we'll look at um, Mayer's good, the bad, the ugly type per classification to the parts of Agile. So, definitions. Agility. The ability to respond effectively to change, especially unpredictable change. Don't have a problem with that. Systems engineering. I'm not going to bother. There are millions of them. And I expect all the people here have at least read one definition of systems engineering. Um, but the biggest reminder I want to give you is the wording of why systems engineering was born. It was out of a need to solve problems not addressable by incremental change. Those last four or, four or five words for you are really important when thinking about Agile. Yeah. And we're talking about Agile systems engineering. The hyphenation here is important. I'm talking about a process for engineering systems using Agile methods. And the reason I want to be clear about that is because I want to keep out of scope the other hyphenation. Agile systems engineering where typically those are systems of modular construction to achieve different needs by reconfiguration. Um, I have lots of personal experience in this space, and believe you me, if I show you the bottom bits, that there are many optimizations which a lot of us as systems engineers are striving to achieve, get thrown away to achieve that latter. And uh, commercially, at least, they are challenging, shall I say. Should we test all possible, validate all possible configurations before we deliver it? even though they may never be deployed? Should we uh, configure uh, and validate just the deployment that's currently going to be used? Because the cost of that validation is significant. Um, how do I validate all the cross-functional stuff? It's, that's really quite tricky. And who owns and pays for and warrants the reconfiguration process? Just because it's capable of being reorganized, how do you reorganize it? Who warrants that process? So I'm going to stay away from that to a large extent. It still reappears because there are texts that conflate the two. So let's look at the Agile Manifesto. I'm going to do this quite as quickly. So these are the 12 principles, where well, I'm questioning whether they're really principles, that are claimed on the Agile Manifesto. So uh, satisfy the customer, ignore the valuable software for a minute, but Continuous delivery, I have sort of a problem with the word continuous in this context, but we'll come back to that. Welcome changing requirements. Uh, as an engineer, I've never welcomed changing requirements. I've been, my job has been to accommodate changing requirements, but never really to welcome them, I must admit. Um, uh, and customer's competitive advantage, yeah, usually that's why they want to change, but often if you push back hard enough and say what it's going to cost them, they may be rethink. Um, deliver working software frequently. Uh, Timescales I'm not really happy with in here. Um, the, there's a sort of principle in, in the Agile process that you, you're, you're pulling up the bridge behind you, and the, the last thing you did is releasable as a deliverable product, and then you move on to the next step, and that, that one behind you is the last one you did. So you're only ever a, a very short distance from something that was product-worthy. For those of us with system engineering, that's, that's a little more tricky to realize. Uh, business people and developers must work together daily. Well, yeah, we're working towards satisfying some stakeholder goals. Why that wouldn't that be true? Um, build projects around motivated individuals. Uh, what's an engineer's motivation? Getting paid at the end of the day? Or actually evolving a new solution? I'm definitely in the latter camp. That's the thing that keeps me interested, is the, the inquisitive nature, the, the solving the problem. Um, the most efficient, effective method of conveying information is face-to-face -face conversation. Well, maybe that's sort of a bit outmoded in our last few years. I'm not entirely convinced I agree with that. Working software as a primary measure of progress. Okay, how many features we developed? Maybe that's a good measure, I don't know. Um, promote sustainable development. The constant pace is the issue here in this statement. 
it's about uh, a response to how Agile was formed. Agile was formed because they, they, it was, software development was seen as a two-pressured environment, mostly in the US, uh, and unrealistic expectations were made in program plans. So Agile was almost a foil to that. It said, well, we're not going to tell you when we're going to deliver it. You give us a set of things you want us to deliver, and we'll work on it until it's done. Yeah. The reality is, if you talk to most Agile developers, they feel more pressured now than they ever did before. Um, continuous attention technical excellence gives design enhances agility. I don't think that's necessarily the thing that drives agility, but I have no problem with always putting attention to technical excellence. Um, simplicity is essential. The front end of that I agree with. The bit in the middle I disagree with entirely. Um, maximizing the amount of work not done. Remember, again, the Agile's view of the world is don't invest in anything that you don't need to do, where the don't need to do is waste in their mantra. Um, so you don't do it if you don't need to do it. So if you don't need to produce any documentation, don't do it. OK. <laughs> the best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. Um, no, not in my world. <laughs> Maybe for some, but I'll give some examples where I actually don't believe that's true anyway. Uh, at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective and choose adjusted behavior. Isn't that classic feedback? Don't we all do that as part of our natural day jobs? So let's start off with one of the major fallacies that Agile seems to have a problem with. It takes the V life cycle. And OK, I don't have a problem with the V life cycle, but if I were read 15288, it is a series of process definitions which can be linked together. Nobody anywhere in that standard says it is a single pass. You do process one, it naturally produces an output, you have to do process two next. In fact, I think it was the cost name guys, Adam and Alex, yesterday, the, the Lego brick approach. You can reuse those Lego bricks any way you want. If you want to repeat it, fine. If you want to use the same process multiple times, fine. The single pass, not realistic. But every uh, comparison with Agile is based on this flawed view that it's a single pass. And in doing so, it's really hard because this sort of handoff apparently is really bureaucratic. And, and of course, you have to know everything about the system right up here. Well, the system engineers, we know that requirements don't reflect all the constraints you're going to put on the system that you design it. You have the stakeholders' inputs about what they require to do, but there are emergent requirements from your company, your culture, et cetera, that happen down this life cycle. So the real world doesn't act like that. And if you went back to Barry Bohm's view of life, Barry Bean's view of life was this, this cone of uncertainty. You don't know much about the system when you start out, and as you progress, you learn more about it. So the agile approach assumes an incremental view, which if you imagine that V cycle sort of closed at the top, and actually, you cycle around it multiple times. You just keep going back and, and going over it again. Then that, that's sort of what their incremental view is about. But even as uh, Powell Douglas says, to work effectively, the incremental approach makes a few assumptions. And actually, a few assumptions is really two when you read his book. Um, the user story implemented in one iteration is independent from those in other, un, un, other unrealized user stories. So the ones you haven't implemented yet are completely independent of the one you were implementing now. Yeah. It's a nice ideal. It's really important. And the second one is the amount of work necessary to refactor existing designs to accommodate new functionality, either the stuff that you will do in the future iterations, is much less than to implement the new functionality. Again, two really important messages which I need you to hold in your head. Let's deal with the first one first and you just hang on to the second one. The first assumption says, if I was doing this in a modeling environment, I'd create a use case story, and that use case story would be representative of coherent system functionality, but it would only map to a single use case. That way I show it's truly independent. Anybody here ever come up with a model which has use cases which are all completely independent? I've not met a system that exists like that yet. So I find that hard to sort of uh, to, to grab. So anyway, in, in my life, back in the 1980s, I'm afraid, or maybe even late 70s, um, we used to do this thing called sort of phased development, where we would take features 
and we develop them. Uh, and we'd start out by doing an element of the feature and do its design, and then when the implementation was started that, the system engineers would start on the next feature straight away. Yeah? So while the development and test was going on, or started, these guys would move on and start doing the next feature. That's not an incremental approach officially. Um, it suggests that the system engineering of the next feature can start before implementation of the previous stage is complete. If you take the Agile mantra, you must complete your delivery. It must be something useful. You can't start the next phase of development until you have got to something useful. So you would have to join these up such that the start of this was at the end of this. That would be the only way that you'd be valid, allowed to call it Agile. So, it was a discussion at the table, I think, the other night, where somebody said, did we get a you know, license for using this? Because this is in our SE handbook. And this is the general perception, I would suggest, of Agile, which is, well, just get on and do stuff. Show you're making some progress. And that's essentially what Agile is trying to portray to people. That's what we're doing. We're making progress. And it's really there to enforce the importance of the concept stage. So it's, it even says that in the, in the figure. Um, I, I think you know, that there's, a, there's a general view that Agile has been abused by a lot of companies to hide a, a less than robust process, shall I say. Um, even chaos in sometimes is termed as Agile. So I'm just going to take another few pops at BPD and use his, uh, use his own self-professed Bruce Almighty. Um, so when he talks about agile systems, he says they are incremental. You have to develop them that way. Um, and in, from an agile software development point of view, it's the point that the developers are only a few minutes away from demonstrating that so far is correct. This is this following you behind with something that's useful to the customer. Um, and to implement such an idea in agile systems, models are critical. Now, that I agree with completely. If I'm modeling a system, I have an opportunity at an abstract level to test its behavior. I can show the partitioning of the structure and whether what I'm explaining appears to be coherent. I can show the transaction between the stakeholder need at one end or the stakeholder need at the other end. I can prove that it does what it says on the tin. I can use that as a validation before I commit to the domain discipline engineering. So I entirely agree with that. Um, the success of incremental agile methods in software development is due largely to the ease with which software can be refactored. Don't have a problem with that at all. You don't really invest much in software in terms of committing costs. If I get it wrong and its structure is wrong, actually I can move the code around quite quickly. Yeah, it, it doesn't really cost me much. So refactoring software is really not a big deal. Um, so what's the big difference then between system engineering and software development? So my view here is that his words are actually quite useful. The outcome of software development is implementation. And the outcome of systems engineering is specification. Our job is to provide specifications to domain disciplines. And depending how expert our domain disciplines are, as to how far we have to progress in telling those domain disciplines what they need to do. If you've got a set of software engineers who are world class, you stop quite quickly. Because it's got to do these things. And you don't tell them how to do it. If you've got some who are probably a little more naive, you maybe need to lead them in a little bit more with the system engineering. It needs to be this sort of structure and behavior. Yeah. That's, that's difficult for some people to absorb, that there isn't a defined line at which you say, this is where you as systems engineering finish your work, because it is dependent on the workforce that's going to follow you in the domain disciplines. So software is essentially infinite and malleable, maybe refactored easily. Yeah, I think I accept that. Systems in general are not so flexible. So if you take that, um, you know, refactoring electronics might mean a recall, refactoring mechanics, uh, retooling in a manufacturing plant. Basically, your, your, your sort of technical debt you're building up by not considering what's coming in the future is considerable. And for some of us who work on large expensive projects which maybe are tens to hundreds of millions of pounds and maybe 10 or 20 years to revenue generation, you can't afford to make mistakes in the early commitments. Just to show his background, uh, those who know Bruce Powell Douglas background, now retired, um, 
He was a software engineer. And I, I don't have a problem with that. I, I came from a software background as well. So, but his statement, I think, really shows his colors. So, you know, electronics and mechanical engineers, they, they just put things together. Software is real invention. You know, that's, that's the hard bit in life. Well, I'm afraid I sort of don't agree with that much either. Um, and why should they be reinventing stuff in software? That begs the question. So, what are the benefits? The benefits is you've got this quality pushing you along because you're always delivering something and the customer's always in the feedback loop, so the customer's always signing off saying, yeah, I like that, I like that, I like that. That's, 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 that's the agile mantra. It's hard for the customer to say no if you've just delivered something and it's a feature and it's a feature that he wants. Uh, big design up front, big bang integration, the, the, the fallacy of the, the big V model. Um, causes all kinds of problems. Well, yeah, it does if you did it only in single pass and you had to understand the entire system at the beginning. I, I have a difficulty in understanding that reality. Um, it means the system specialists, in his view, are correct now, but might be incomplete. Well, okay, that's okay. Um, you're reducing that air gap because you're always talking to the customer. So yeah, he's signing off on the bits, but it allows you to validate and demonstrate a correct but incomplete system, but it doesn't admit that further change might invalidate it all because it's based on this independent story. If it's truly independent, it won't invalidate it. But we've just almost agreed that that rarely happens. Um, and I would contest the big design up front causes inappropriate architectures any more than an incremental approach does. Um, depends on the level of your design investment. Yeah. Where I'm using the, the view of architecture being the set of significant decisions about an organization of the system. So if I'm understanding what the system has to do as a whole, at maturity, at the complete feature set, I am more likely, in my view, to make appropriate decisions out about how I structure it, appropriate decisions about the behavior, than I would if I give a, an inkling of a little bit of that text and then later came back and said, oh, well, by the way, you've got to come like this as well. Oh, and by the way, you've got to come like this as well. I, I, personally, I find that, that incremental reveal to be challenging. So back to the two major questions then. And for me, these are the two really good test cases for knowing whether Agile fits with your system engineering very easily or not. If your use cases implemented in one iteration are independent from those in another unrealized case, stuff you're going to do in the future, you're probably on a good start point. You can use Agile SE. Okay? It's an Agile approach. If the amount of work necessary to refactor existing designs and implementation is much less than implement new functionality, again, you're probably on a good starter. Now, that doesn't only just fit software. So let's just underline those two statements. So the evidence against assumption one, independent use cases cause low integration, poor physical system optimization. And if you read the Agile, um, uh, the SE handbook on Agile, it causes an expense of infrastructure and modularity. That's a necessary evil. Yeah? So that really doesn't fit with what I do as a system engineer, where most of my customers are looking for some sort of optimization. Well, that optimization is often a broad church of things which they're going to accept as their priorities. Um, so I can't really deal with the penalties of volume, mass, power, whatever, whatever it is that my customer is sensitive to. So for me, in the physical, the cyber system world, the underlying uh, assumption of independence is largely invalid. Practically none of the systems I work on ever come into that class. So let's take no assumption two, refactoring existing designs. So software is easily refactored. Yeah, I have no problem with that. Systems, when constrained by physics, are not. That's my general principle. If I have to refactor the electronics from getting a recall, refactor the mechanics, retooling, that's a bit of a constraint. And you know, if I was to build a gas turbine engine and decide this bit works well for compressor but doesn't work for the turbine, and I have to refactor the whole engine, somebody might get upset. So for me, that means the underlying assumption of easy refactorability is also invalid for most of my work. I have to have a longer term view 
of what it's going to look like at maturity so that I can shoehorn things in without having to change that final view. And I'll go back to the, the statement of why SE was born. Not addressable by incremental changes. These things are what enable incremental changes. SE was born because we can't accommodate things by incremental changes. I think fundamentally there's a, there's a conflict there between using Agile with these expectations of independence and the reason SE was born. So let's take a pot shot at uh, the scaled Agile framework. That's, that's always good for another laugh. You will find the word system engineering in the scaled Agile framework. If you read the scaled Agile framework, and there's an awful lot of the scaled Agile framework, don't get me wrong, um, I would say it has trouble integrating system engineering. In fact, so much so that the system engineering words appear slightly somewhere else as well. They appear here, system architect and engineer. Those are about the only two places that that wording really appears in the whole of scaled agile framework. And then when you look into it in a really sort of deep fashion, you realize that according to the scaled agile framework, the system team is a specialized agile team that assist in building and supporting the agile development environment. These are the guys who own the process of building the product in its incremental fashion and making sure it works. That, in their world, is what the system engineering team does. They organize how things come together, make sure the products are compatible at those points, and deliver it. That's, the drawbridge now is not just a software team pulling up behind it. It's, it's a series of things that have to come together to enable some capability in the scaled agile framework. That I have no problem with making the system team only responsible for when it comes together, rather than designing how it should come together, to me seems to miss the point. So in Scaled Agile Framework, um, it has a, the system engineering has a, a non-traditional scope, shall I say. It is designed to support tools and methods of large-scale IT developments, basically. And if you think IT solutions, you, you're probably not far off from the Scaled Agile Frameworks of your life. Um, it does mention the attributes of cyber physical systems, but then does nothing with them, which for me wasn't useful. Um, again, it has the flawed comparison with a single V lifecycle pass. Um, and counter to strict agile, it preserves, preserves options. Remember that thing about don't do anything you don't need to do. No waste. In a really extreme agile cases, you don't start by thinking about what the future is. You start by doing some work, prototyping, converting that to product. There is no such thing as a prototype in Agile. What you were working on is product. Yeah. Um, so a little bit of tension there. Um, evolutionary delivery uses programmable technologies. Okay, for certain classes of system, that might be acceptable. I might, I don't know, put down a big ASIC, which I can reconfigure and put out more communication ports on it. But if I have physicality in terms of interconnects, or I have power transfer issues, or I have electrical consumption issues, putting in a very expensive reconfigurable solution just in case probably commercially won't fly with a lot of my customers. And from a safety and security perspective, my God, would we be in trouble? Yeah. Um, so difficult. Architecting the system, again, assumes this independence of features. At least that you can chop the program up and say, right, all these use cases to live together. It's a bit more lumpy model than the strict agile, which sort of assumes very piecemeal process. You know, it's a bit like the mathematician's approach of reducing a curve to lots of linear sections. Uh, the agile approach assumes these lots of linear sections. At least with the scaled agile framework, there's a sort of belief that there are touch points. These two curves have to come together at some point, And at that point, I really have to have the coherent answer. But it really lacks information on how you achieve that. How do you predict it's going to happen? How do you know where it's going to happen? So let's take another pot shot. Let's, uh, let's have another go at the SE handbook. The only reason I have a go at the SE handbook is it seems to conflate some of the ideas. And this is why I had to steer away from the agile systems engineering scope. So I have no problem with this first set of statement. The agility is a capability exhibited by systems and processes to sustain effective operation under conditions of unpredictability, uncertainty, and change. Yeah, that sounds like an agile approach. You're going to accept some change. You've got to be able to cope with it. 
the value proposition is development speed and quality. Sort of resonates with the BPD view of life. Yeah? Don't have, really don't have much problem with that. This bit that I do, though. Agile SE and Agile Systems Engineering are two different things. Tick, I agree. With a shared common architecture. Really? Where did that come from? If I'm designing something for modularity, I may have a completely different architectural approach to where I'm trying to do something optimal. Yeah, I may be willing to compromise that completely. So I'm not sure I agree with that statement. Um, and it goes on to say it's, it's a drag and drop plug and play. So they're obviously talking about agile systems engineering there, not about agile SE. Yeah. One's a process, one's an architecture. Um, an agile system architecture incurs expense and infrastructure modularity. Yeah, we just said that. You know, you, you are compromising things by doing that. Um, agility is the ability to respond effectively to surprises, good or bad. Uh, yeah, maybe. I think if I look at Carson and Silto, their view of life is if you are living within a systems environment and understanding the customer's system, you can sort of predict what sort of change might come along. You can't predict all possible disruptions, but you can sort of understand where they might be going. So they can forecast likely change, but what you can't deal with is the unpredictable. You know, that may give you some margin, don't get me wrong. It may give you something which people perceive as agility. Personally, I perceive it as robustness rather than agility. But, okay. So building in modularity does not endow the ability to accommodate the unpredictable. Let me get that absolutely clear. Most of my term working on product line uh, engineering environments is agreeing a scope, agreeing a set of variants with the business that your engineering solution can accommodate, not that all possible disruptions and variations are achievable and deliver something valuable. Um, so it's unclear then what makes a particular system agile given that that agility might be unpredictable. Are you surprised? I'm not entirely convinced I understand what an agile system is in that case. So let's just go back to the, um, the context because I said at the beginning, you know, this is really important, this context. So let's start with the a system realized entirely in a software engineering context. So you might call it a software system. I don't care, whatever it is. As far as I'm concerned, if it only takes system engineers as a discipline domain to realize your system, they fit in this category. Most of these guys will deal with software tools, they're virtual connectors, you know, there's no physical manifestation. Refactoring this stuff is actually quite easy. I don't care whether I'm an IT box builder and I'm just using off-the-shelf products or commercial boxes, I can move this stuff around quite quickly because all the interfaces are standardized, I can just reconnect them in a different organization, I can change the software load, I can change where things are. Easy. A system engineering context containing software, and I'm gonna always uh, containing software because I'm not a mechanical engineer, I've never really dealt with entirely mechanical systems with no intelligence. Yeah. So, a cyber physical system often includes physical flows. Because we've got physical flows, we've usually got control of something which impacts the system, i.e. power, thermal, any sort of energy transfer is immediately giving you some structure which is hard to change. If I box something up because it's trying to resolve some power dissipation or some power consumption issues, if I've got a shaft or an electrical wire or whatever, passing stuff, I have committed some physicality. To then go along and say, actually, you know I've got that one connector out of the back of there and I didn't have to worry about thermal, well I, I do in this particular case. Okay, problem. Talk to nuclear reactor guys and how often they like to pierce the uh, casing on a reactor. Um, so there may be significant costs in resolving physical solutions and there are often technology restrictions. So. Okay, to me that just says avoiding flawed solutions is clearly more important in physical systems than it is in software systems. 
And it's that trade of investment decision that really we are playing with, with physical systems. The more you can predict this, that's technical debt. Yeah, that's really what they're trying to avoid. So a little, little bit of a laugh. Here's the system engineering view of a human body. Okay, there are a few systems in the body. Yeah, they're not independent. They have an awful lot of interaction. Yeah, there's a little bit of redundancy in there. You know, they're, they're, they're pretty good. Um, if I was to take that same view from a software point of view, I might go, okay, there's a pair of legs. That's for wandering around. Uh, there's a torso to connect everything. There's a pair of arms. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, what's it got to do at the end? Well, not entirely sure. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine the refactoring of the cost of completion when you uh, got all those bits assembled and find it didn't do the job you wanted it to do. The other one that I really have a problem with is this view of customer in the, in the agile world. For, for me, customer sort of assumes a singularity and, and often is the paymaster in a lot of people's perceptions. As a system engineer, I deal with a whole group of stakeholders, yeah? not just one paymaster. In fact, often the paymaster isn't even bothered what the system really does. All he's bothered is about the commercial revenue we're going to make from it. So if, if my customer is deriving my product backlog, and any of those of you who do Agile, you'll know the first thing you do is, is you build the priority of all the features that you actually want to deliver. And then you break it up into bits and pieces for selected product backlogs, and you do, you do sprints and scrums, et cetera, to achieve them. Well, that's great. So um, I'm your customer. Uh, I'd like a house, please. Um, I'd really like a roof because it rains a lot out here. Yeah. And on the next iteration, um, can we talk about how many rooms and floors it's got to have? You've built the roof now. Uh, well, just jack it up a floor or two because I actually need it to be a 12-story building. Um, and then can we discuss how it's going to be used? If I did my system engineering in that sort of order, because that's what the customer realized as value, I wouldn't get very far because it would be mega expensive to deliver. So I'm going to reimagine the Agile Manifesto by distorting it. Our highest priority to satisfy stakeholders, not customer. Um, and I'm going to ditch early and continuous, and I'm going to say frequent periodic delivery. For me, that sort of more matches where I really live. I'm trying to give a customer something as early as possible, mainly because you'll be on my case about you haven't done anything yet until I give him something. Um, validated system specs, and that really is, in my job as system engineer, I'm passing to them these domain engineers, enable them to get started. Yeah. I am going to take the coherence issue to allow them some independence to carry on and develop that stuff. But if I'm talking to an electronics engineer, a mechanical engineer, I'm going to have to tell him the final outcome of the package at day one. I need you to build a box with this number of connectors on it of this style, capable of carrying these things. Or well, the electrical guys, you know, this sort of wiring. I can't go into and say, today I want you to implement an Ethernet interface uh, and stick it in a box. And then go back the next day and say, uh, actually, I need 15 Ethernet interfaces. Uh, <laughs> he wouldn't be happy. Accommodating change in requirements, as I said, you know, uh, welcoming. <laughs> um, enabling the customer to understand the impact alongside competitive advantage. One of the things that I l love from modeling is my ability to quickly say, if you make these changes, these are all the things that are going to change. All your domain dips are going to change. These are the things you're going to have to throw away, the investment you make, especially later on when he suddenly decides, actually, the market's moved on a bit and I need to implement something else to do a, at least a me too. And you help him recognize what he's having to give away. And often that's delivery or other feature content or cost, at least cost of engineering. Uh, that makes a much more powerful tool than saying, yeah, yeah, of course we can accommodate it. Uh, I won't tell you when we'll deliver, we'll, we'll accommodate it. Yeah. Um, so our job is to deliver validated system specs, where validated at this point is at a system level. If you construct it this way with these behaviors, it will satisfy these stakeholder needs. Yeah. Um, business people and developers must work together. I, I don't have a problem with that. I just strike the daily. I, I think that should be a permanent conversation, personally. 
Um, I'm not sure about the motivated individuals. I would much rather have competent people with really good tools and processes that show them what they should be doing. That way I could be much more consistent. And in a high integrity business, you wouldn't be able to walk away from that. Giving it just to motivated individuals probably won't deliver the dot. The model is a single point of truth. I don't believe in this point-to-point -point communication. Especially as one of the real problems with the agile world is there's a sort of belief that everybody in the agile team is A, co-located, B, equally competent, and C, all of the same domain. That's not my world. So if I have a hydraulic engineer come in and talk about the problems he has in controlling a valve and he needs a control strategy from the software to overcome it, there's a system engineer in the middle interpreting what that means. You know, as a system, we need to do this. Therefore, we've got to control this in a different way. If you try and get a hydraulic engineer to talk to a software engineer, they talk different languages. Yeah. Really difficult. So I'd rather have a point of truth in the model that understands the impact of all those domain disciplines. Validated system specs are a primary measure of progress. I have no problem with that. In fact, that would be a KPI I would love to adopt universally and say, actually, as system engineers, what you're generating is stuff that the domain disciplines can use and carry on with. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to delete this one because, uh, well, where does it live? Promote sustainable development. It actually doesn't work. Even the Gadgetal pundits will tell you it doesn't really do what it says on the tin. Um, continuous attention to excellence and good design enhances agility. No, it doesn't. But a model containing a well founded system architecture enables the impact of change to be assessed. And I think that's really important. Simplicity. I have no problem with simplicity, but my reasoning for simplicity is minimizing accidental complexity. That's my job. I don't care whether it saves me waste because waste, in my view, is recognizing that actually that would lead me to a dead end path. Yeah. Um, the best architectures are designed for self-organized teams. <coughs> Bullshit. <coughs> At regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective. Yeah, I have no problem with that, but they don't change their behavior. They should look to feedback in terms of their competence, their processes, their tools. So, if I've made all those changes, is it really agile anymore? It's sort of trying to hit the same spot, but I don't think I would use agile as a word. I, I'd like to, you know, if we could call them, term a new term that was equivalent, I'd have no problem with that sort of a, a manifesto. So, Let's get to the, the structure then of, of Mayer's type uh, response. What's brilliant about Agile? Focus, really actually quite important and often we miss the point that we're trying to satisfy some stakeholder need. So the brilliant bit of Agile is it is centered around a stakeholder need, yeah? not just a customer. Um, test. One of the inbuilt implications of the, pulling this drawbridge behind you is that you've always validated what you've done. You can't pull up a drawbridge behind you and say successfully, I am at a new point that is useful to a stakeholder until I validated that it actually does what it says on the tin. So the idea of generating a test and retesting it at every iteration, because remember, we didn't admit that future iterations might compromise what we'd already done. I think that's true. So retest in my world is not just test what your new future's done, but retest all the old features are still there. Yeah. Don't allow change while developing that feature. N most people don't see this as part of Agile, but Agile is really quite time-boxed. Once you start a Scrum, nothing is allowed to change. You snapshot the requirement at the beginning of that scrum, you run with it until you finish that scrum. Where finish is complete, and in the software view, there's a software delivery that comes out of it. Even if it was wrong, you still progress and you complete that scrum. Yeah. Useful. Time box development, so you always finish the development. Yeah, it's always functionally usable. I think that's a good ad adjective, and I think that's no different to where I was during phase development in my early career. 
the project priorities tracks the customer valued features, stakeholder valued features in my world. Um, project managers, of course, you don't have in, in Agile. You have these sort of proxies who actually are not the customer. And then, of course, you have an Agile coach who's a process master. Um, validation mechanisms, code design features, that's really a bit like the, big, the front. And so, good parts. Refactoring for simplification, I have no problem with that, simplifying things, but for the right reasons, as long as you don't throw away an understanding of what it was you were trying to deliver in the first place. Regular progress meetings. Okay, strike the daily, but yeah, it, it's good to know that you're actually coherent in where you're going. Uh, and a manager's job is always to remove impediments, but so, of course, we don't have managers in Agile, so who's doing that job? Well, the team's got to do it, isn't it? Um, high bandwidth team communication. I have no problem with the principle of a high, high bandwidth communication. I have problems with it being face-to-face -face or coherent or capable or competent across all domains. Remove waste. Yep, I don't have a problem with that. Um, needs a lot of care in deciding what is waste. Yeah. If I take an engineering view, there's a lot of engineers who decide that anything that they do is okay. Everything that everybody else does is waste. Um, things that never worked. Hyped parts of Agile, four eyes, pair programming. There are lots of evidence to say this stuff where somebody else watches over you doesn't work. It does not deliver any value whatsoever. However, review, by the way, does, always. Uh, open space working. Mm. Self-organizing teams. In my world, if you want to really understand whether self-organizing teams deliver, the ideological collective ownership is open source software. If it was that good, open source software would use Agile. It doesn't. Does that tell you something? No, it's complete freedom to use whatever process they like, but it's not the system they have. Working at a sustainable pace, uh, yeah, no planning. Mm -hmm. Project managers might get a bit jumpy at that. Um, and in re reality, that doesn't change the wish to incommodate more. So I'm not entirely sure that it ever works. Uh, estimation claimed to be unique to Agile. Well, we all do estimation. The, the way they do estimation is actually a, a traditional wideband Delphi method. It's, it's nothing novel, um, invented in the 80s. Uh, the bad and ugly parts, deprecation of upfront tasks. That's, that's our job, to look far enough into the future to, to survive the technical debt. Um, agile economics, short-term savings. If you look at most agile developments, you'll see you also get this, uh, this ops dev type, you know, DevOps stuff, which goes alongside, which is actually where the software is fixed throughout its life. So Agile delivers the first cut of it, and then another team takes over, and for the next 10 years, keeps it working. Yeah. That's not where I would live. Um, embedded customer, oh, okay, which stakeholders are the customer? I don't, I don't know. Um, and some of those stakeholders might be machinery. They might be standards. Where are they represented? Okay. Test-driven development, define the test first and test regularly. Okay, that's fine. Uh, if it passes, it's good. Woo. This reminded me of my teenage sons. Pass the test, that's it. They know how to drive. Uh, no. <laughs> Wait until you get to your first winter. <laughs> uh, the bad and ugly parts, well, feature-based developments with assumed independence. I really do struggle with that one in the real world. Um, the idea that I can go, oops, I missed that. Sorry, throw it all away and start again. Yeah. Uh, and because the cost of providing test facilities, a lot of my life was about uh, providing test harnesses or test equipments to deal with part solutions. Um, cost of refactoring largely ignores the cost of commitment to domain specialist engineering. So as system engineers, we've not worried about what they've got to commit to. Um, not just the cost of design, but revalidation of all the compromise elements. So every time I make a change to compromise something they've done, they're not going to be happy bunnies. So standards, lack of compliance evidence, difficult to assess capabilities. Uh, and so... Agile is more useful and practical for SE in the environments where there are no physicality, where there are tasks with rapid independent iteration, prototyping, requirements gathering, user interface. There are parts of our system generation that actually take to Agile really well. Yeah? 
Um, incremental approaches also solve those problems. So it's not the deep system engineering that you might traditionally do, but there are parts of the job. Where it fails, where it's about cost and risk reduction, where it's significant refactoring, where it's about optimization. And I'm afraid for me, that list is an awful lot of my life. So Agile may be a tarnished brand for application to physical systems engineering systems. That shouldn't stop us trying to please our customers and stakeholders better. Yeah. Having first safeguarded is future cost and risk. That's it. Thank you very much. I've, I've run long enough so you can't get questions in. <laughs> yeah, I, I did cut you short a little bit there just to see if... So, thank you, Stuart. Is there anyone that's got... Oh, so they were, we need a second session. <laughs> Hello. Um, my name is Yohandi Gbalegeshin from Capgemini Engineering. Um, I found that really, really, really useful um, because lots of what you say are things I've sort of thought about. I feel like... Um, Agile is something that a lot of infrastructure owners and lots of our clients are asking for because it means that they can start to realize some kind of outcome as quickly as possible. But obviously, where it starts to fall down is I really like your manifesto reimagined. And one of the main things that I will pick up is that the moment you start to think of impact analysis of change, especially when you have physical infrastructure or high integrity um, systems, it really starts to collapse. And I'm kind of wondering why the clients or infrastructure owners are not seeing from feasibility studies that this starts to fall down immediately, you put any kind of impact analysis in. So do, do you have any views on that? And yeah, wh why, are, why aren't we saying, for example, let's rewrite a manifesto so that we can actually get something that works? So I'll, I'll reflect back then. How many companies who've employed Agile as a, a, an ability to try and reduce development costs have actually measured the technical debt and the total cost of deployment? Anybody here have a view on that? I've never met one that really understood that what they've done is short-term apparent progress, but longer-term cost. Yeah. It's about picking the right context. It's very clear there are aspects of what we do in system engineering that are like a duck swimming on water for our job. They're really easy to apply. They are completely independent. Uh, and they tend to be in the, in the discovery phases or in the prototyping phases. But once you've decided on what the concept and solution are going to be, you are generally, for physical systems, committing an awful lot of opportunity for technical debt. And at that point, you've got to be pretty sure that you're able to meet all the demands met of you, which means you have to have an understanding of all those demands. And it's at that point, accommodating change, and I use the word accommodating, um, is, is the really tricky part. Because you've had to almost freeze some element of your view, not only of what you're going to do, but the margins of design that you're going to deploy to use up in accommodating those things which haven't yet been understood. Yeah. One really quick. Uh, Simon Wright here. Um, you haven't addressed the four values that the original Agile Manifesto uh, expounded. Um, are you thinking of doing that? Uh, is it in the paper? Um, Give me your four values that you believe. Well, I've got it, you know, yep. the Agile Manifesto. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Working software over comprehensive documentation. Customer collaboration over contract negotiations. Responding to change over following a plan. That's where it started from. Yep. And, and they're not values though, are they? But that's, that's the reality. If you, if, yeah. you, if you read Bertrand Mayer's book, he, he will go through that and says, actually, these are anecdotal claims yeah. about delivery. They're not really values that you can deliver on. You know, what, how do I decree what's waste? My view of waste is going to be different to every other stakeholder's view of waste. You know, if I'm working with a I know, defense customer, he may want a textual document of uh, the solution because that's his tradition. That's complete waste for me, maybe. 
And I may have to invent, I don't know, document output from my model just to satisfy that. But it's still a contractual requirement. So it's, it's very hard to, to achieve those values, I believe. So I think, thank you. I think this is a, a conversation that will and can continue well into coffee and, and for the rest of the day, Stuart's going to be around, so feel free to find him. Let me uh, thank you again, Stuart. Thank you.